We have already made a small introduction to the law of human rights, international protection of human rights, or international human rights law. Um, there, we did not mention the main sources of uh, human rights protection according to international law. We have mentioned the very basics, the principles, and uh, the role of local institutions or regional institutions, but we did not mention the details of international human rights law. We have said that actually the role of international institutions or international organizations uh, are smaller than the role of local level. So the main protector of human rights, as we have said, it is the state. That's true. The state protects human rights majorly. And then the other steps come forth. International human rights law is based upon numerous diverse uh, conventions and treaties and so on. But it is majorly based upon the Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights is composed of three different documents. The first one is, you're quite familiar with this one, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not an international treaty, it's a declaration. This is composed also of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Those three come together to compose the International Bill of Rights. All other international human rights treaties are mainly based on those three. They are not quite detailed papers, <coughs> however they set the main principles of human rights, international human rights. Well, there are the basics, but you know that there are several diverse treaties, like that can be the uh, Genocide Convention or the Convention related to the Migrant Workers, Convention Against Torture, diverse conventions against discrimination of diverse minority groups or uh, like discrimination, that, uh, that covenant that prohibits discrimination against females or discrimination against disabled people and numerous diverse uh, covenants related to the rights of child or children, uh, refugee, migrants, asylum seeker conventions, diverse of them as well. And rights have different categories. I guess we have mentioned that part. We can talk about core rights on one hand. On the other hand, we can talk about civil and political rights, just like in the convention. Or the third group is economic, social and cultural rights. This distinction is mainly based for uh, or made for scientific purposes. Those rights are indivisible. Those rights are interrelated and they're interdependent. Therefore, there is the question we have asked in our last class. Um, if there's a ranking in between rights, no, the answer is no. There is no ranking in between rights. However, we need to categorize them in order to study them in a more detailed manner. Of course, core rights are directly related to your life and your physical integrity. Uh, mental integrity, that's true. However, we cannot expect any kind of uh, ranking among them. All of them are important, all of them are central for us. While studying, we can make distinctions like core rights and other rights, because they're directly related to your survival. Or we can study civil and political rights uh, comparing to economic, social and cultural rights. It's also possible to conduct studies comparing individual rights to collectivities' rights. However, this does not mean that they are not related. They're directly related. Rights of individuals are directly related to the rights of uh, communities, of course, and collectivities. 
Individual rights are directly related to the dignity of humankind, the worth of humankind, the importance of human rights. And once individual rights are established, then rights of collectivities can be established above that. And rights of collectivities, we have just mentioned, like uh, we have mentioned the co um, conventions related to uh, prohibition of discrimination against certain groups. They are collectivity rights, minority rights, or protection of the child, protection of um, women, protection of migrants, ch child or working uh, migrants, and so on. They're the, all collectivity rights. Therefore, we make distinctions, we have categories, but the most important thing that you have to remember is that they are all interrelated, they're indivisible, and they're interdependent. Keep this in mind. This is really central to the studies of international human rights. There are certain principles that you should always think of while studying international human rights protection. Uh, one of them is related to Jus Kogan's principle. We have studied it in one of our very first classes, right? Do you remember what Jus Kogan says? That comes from Roman law, that's true. Uh, actions to maintain peace cannot violate human rights. That's true. What else do you remember from Jus Kogan's? That's compelling law. That's peremptory norm. So whatever is done in international law, that cannot exceed certain limits. For instance, all nations are allowed to, con or all, all states are uh, allowed to conclude agreements with each other in any issue area. That's what you agree, right? That can be a trade agreement, that can be an agreement in justice, or that can be something related to uh, trade laws, finance laws, health laws. However, we never hear states concluding agreements with each other for enabling slavery. Impossible, because that's something against human rights. So Jus Kogan's principle is there to protect basic human rights. In our last class, in the last session, we have already mentioned non-discrimination and equality principles as well. We have said that equality is not a right, that's a principle. And how to achieve equality depends. Equality does not always mean the very same kind of treatment to everybody, because everybody People are coming from diverse backgrounds. That can be a financial background, that can be gender, that can be uh, religion, that can be education. And when similar treatment or same treatment is given to everybody, then this can also be disadvantages. So equality is a principle, but the methods to reach that equality differs, of course. For instance, formerly in the United States, all public pools were uh, whites only. And then on behalf of equality principle, state was obliged to open all pools to everybody. Instead of doing so, they have decided to close all pools instead of making it uh, open for everybody. So is this a good example for equality? It has to be beneficial, it has to be useful for the people. Inconsistent treatment is also quite typical, of course. Sometimes that can also be necessary. As you remember, we have given the example of taxation. Um, if the state says that I'll be collecting 100 bucks from everybody each month, well, that can be also too much for certain groups, and for certain groups, that can be too low and easy to pay. Therefore, sometimes inconsistent treatment is necessary on behalf of uh, equality, so a certain percentage of the income. So that percentage gives a different sum at the end, but then this brings equality. 
Treating equally regardless of the backgrounds can therefore be brutal. And we have said that it has to be useful and beneficial. Equal torture for everybody is not something acceptable because torture is already not acceptable. All right. So achievement of equality is based upon the conditions, is based upon the situation in the state. And it must be always beneficial. Yes. Uh, if it's the definition of equality, so what is the justice? I think I am like. Uh, they're not the same principle, actually. Yeah, just but, like, the way you explained, I was like, equal means like just giving everyone the same. But we have said that definitely not. Yeah. But definitely not. It's like making beneficial, <coughs> like benefits for everyone by not giving the equal. Is it? It is not. It's quite philosophical, actually, what we're saying, and it's quite questionable, and probably it is not the definition of justice, and we never use the word equality and justice interchangeably. Definitely they are different, and they require um, a very detailed addressing. Okay? So what you have learned is that equality is not a right. It is? Principle, definitely principle, and establishment of equality depends upon the conditions. It must be always beneficial. Equality principle is already referred by the Universal Declaration. We have said that the Universal Declaration is definitely not a treaty, but it sets the basics of entire human rights. And there it says that, for instance, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So equality principle is already mentioned in the very beginning of the Universal Declaration. And there are many other sentences that you come across, like the uh, seventh article, all are equal before law. So equality, you know, once we start talking about equality in between genders, then there's always one brilliant person raising hands saying that, but women and men, they have different bodies. Applause, none. Yes, that's the answer. No, of course not. We're calling for equality for everybody, not to make everybody with the same building, bodybuilding uh, or financial building, what we're trying to sustain is equality before social norms, equality before law. So what equality indicates in our human rights context is providing everybody with the same opportunities and preventing them from same dangers, whatever they are. What we know is that states, they're the main protector of human rights. States also ban human rights from time to time. They limit them. We already know that all states have different human rights implementations or how they digest human rights differ from one country to another. That's for sure. We always give those typical examples of comparing Europe with Saudi Arabia, for instance. So, that depends on their own regime, and that's something directly related to their sovereignty. Regardless of that, what we know is that states can also uh, derogate rights, limit our rights from time to time. Well, we're living in Turkey, and for a long time we have lived under what? Emergency. State of emergency, that's true. And under state of emergency, most of our rights were limited. What we know is that, for instance, right to assembly was limited. We could, perhaps under normal conditions, according to our constitution, Turkish constitution, during daytime, we're allowed to do any kind of demonstration as long as we're not blocking the streets, for instance. However, during state of emergency, we were not allowed to perform our right to demonstrate anything. So normally, uh, I guess we have already given this example in our former session, 70 people in this class. Well, we can meet here in our university, but if we directly decide to meet in the middle of the city altogether, probably 
please would ask us to uh, dissolve as soon as possible because they are never sure about our intentions and uh, probably that's about national security, that's also about the security of us as well. And to ensure that states are able to limit those rights. Which rights can be limited by the state? Definitely not the core rights. That's the most important part. And when states want to limit our rights, then they are for most of the time civil and political rights, rather than economic, social and cultural ones. And those limitations are done on behalf of security, mainly national security. And once state decides to limit the rights, they tell it to their people. And then they also share this information with their fellow states as well, because they share many international treaties with other states. Therefore, they also uh, inform their fellow states that they're going for certain limitations because of certain reasons for a certain time. And those limitations require proportion, uh, proportionate uh, being. Therefore, those limitations can be done in political and civil rights. They cannot be discriminatory, therefore certain times, and for mainly security reasons. Core rights are never limited. What we know is that, you have a question, Sina? No? Yes. Is there a difference between state of emergency and martial law in their capacity to limit the yes, 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 actually. But let's not mention it yet. Um, human rights is a field that's sadly expanding in both directions, in horizontal and vertical ways. And how does that happen? For instance, our right to live, life, it is here. Right to life was always known. The thing is that actually that was okay to torture people, for instance, even in Europe until the end of 19th century, in even uh, the beginning of 20th century. Or death penalty, capital punishment, they used to exist. In time, as we have better understood the meaning of right to life, then states have started to abolish the capital punishment because it's a punishment that cannot be taken back. Right to life cannot be given back when the judge is wrong about their jurisdiction. At that point, right to life has expanded after capital punishment was abolished, for instance. Right to human dignity was always known. However, in the very beginning, it was only um, acknowledged for male citizens. Later females were included, later children's rights were included to that dignity, and later torture is abolished. Therefore, the right has expanded vertically. So this is a vertical expansion. What we know is that new rights also emerge. Like people with AIDS, so HIV. Their rights are not new. LGBT rights, they're new, right? And such rights are expanding. The thing is that, by the way, are you familiar with Dalits, who they are? Have you ever heard of that name? But I'm sure you have heard of the caste system in India, the Brahmans and so on. In that list, there are four castes plus outcasts, which are Dalits. When Dalits cook something, none of those caste levels eat their food because they are assumed to be dirty. When they're assumed to be dirty, then they cannot work in uh, 
nice jobs actually. They can burn the dead bodies, they can clean the toilets, that's what they're allowed to do. And they cannot live all together with the rest of the uh, castes in the city. So their rights were not known. Actually, if you read books about the gypsies living in Ottoman and in Balkans, then you come across with different explanations saying that those uh, gypsies that we used to know in Ottoman Empire were Dalits because they were not able to survive in India with their social uh, system. They needed to leave their country. They have gone through diverse countries like Iran and then Ottoman Empire and then Balkans. So there are the basi basis of gypsies according to certain explanations. Well, their rights were not known. In time, it is seen that those people had to be included. Then their rights have emerged. The question is, how do new human rights emerge? They emerge as a huge uh, series of actions. The first thing that happens to groups of people is exclusion. They're excluded from the society. Society does not want to include them. They're accepted as dirty, unacceptable, unwelcomed. And later, that society starts to include them. The thing is that it never happens uh, automatically. What we need in between exclusion and inclusion is awareness building. That's why NGOs are quite important. What NGOs do is, for instance, when a kid is abused, then there's a court case. And no one hears about that court case. The NGO informs the entire media of that court case. And they gather a huge number of people with them. They go to the courthouse. Then when media is also there, they explain what has happened to the kid and how the laws are at the moment related to the kid and how the judge is going to give a jurisdiction. So suddenly that event, before it was unknown, later it becomes top news in the newspapers. This is how the entire awareness is built. Um, pride walks, honor walks. Many people think that, well, what is the use of that pride walks in the cities when all like homosexuals and all other groups show themselves in the streets? What's the use of that? Doing nothing is always doing nothing. However, in order to establish awareness, people are supposed to become, first of all, visible. That visibility is not only on the street and then on the press, on the websites, and people start to learn about them. So this is how awareness building happens. After awareness building, inclusion starts. For instance, HIV positive people were excluded. But as a result of awareness building activities of NGOs, people have learned that actually, uh, only blood contact or sexual contact can bring the entire contamination. Social contact should not be a right that's uh, going to be deprived of them. So HIV positive people were included to their educational life or working life, whatever, after awareness building. So first three steps are first exclusion, awareness building, and then inclusion. Still, inclusion is not sufficient for the birth of a new right. Following inclusion, what is necessary is domestic legislation. Therefore, MPs are expected to prepare drafts of legislation, and bring it to the parliament. This is spread to entire MPs in the parliament. They read through it. They either reject it or accept it or first amend it. And then the legislation takes place. And uh, within the domestic laws, those rights are included. How many states are around the world? 
hundred ninety eight is something like two hundred actually, but hundred ninety eight is the number in the United Nations. When only one state does it, it doesn't mean a lot. But once a state uh, creates a new right through its domestic legislation, then the others start to follow them. And after this mushrooming becomes widespread, then states want to create an awareness in the international level and they prepare international treaties. For instance, International Treaty on Migrant Workers is open for signature. At the moment, signatory states are less than 50 states. But in every possible diplomatic contact, those signatory parties uh, invite other states for their own uh, created treaties so that because migrants are all around the world at the moment and they're easy to abuse they can be easily exploited in order to stop this happening in their diplomatic context for instance when a state and b state are trying to establish trade relations state b if it's more powerful than the state a it can easily say that if you sign the migrant workers treaties then we're going to provide you with new well, carrots, whatever that is, uh, what that incentive is. So this is how new human rights emerge from the local level to international level. Could you follow everything? Yes? Do you have any questions related to the birth of new rights? Did you also understand how the vertical expansion of the rights happen? Vertical expansion? Of course, definitely. Uh, so when the right to live is reconceptualized, mm -hmm. that's horizontal because the death penalty is abolished. That's vertical because the right is already there, but it was a short right. The limit was death penalty. That limit is removed and it has become then a vertical expansion. Horizontal expansion is always emergence of new rights. All right? Do you have the slightest wrong, right? The is it? Yeah. It's the other way around. Yeah. Okay, then it should be corrected. I'll take a closer look at that. Good. So when marriage right expands to LGBT, <coughs> it's vertical. I mean, LGBT rights is a horizontal right, but if you take right to... Uh, like social right, we're limited to homosexual marriage. When it is removed, then it is also seen as a uh, vertical expansion. It is necessary to define what kind of an expansion is that related to your research uh, targets, of course. All right? But emergence of new rights is always horizontal. Any questions until here? If not, we have said that states are the main protectors of human rights. The question is, what are their obligations and what if they do not follow their obligations? First of all, their obligations are threefold. They have obligation to respect, obligation to protect and obligation to fulfill. What they mean is that, for instance, your right for education. What you need is school buildings, plus teachers, plus administrative staff in that schools, and the ministry as well. So the state must take action, right? They have to do the construction of the school building. They have to raise uh, teachers, pay for them, also employ the administrative staff. When the state is active, this is obligation to fulfill. So state must take action. Your religious rights, your right to faith. At that point, you can believe in Islam, you can believe in Christianity, you can be a Jewish citizen, you can believe in spaghetti monster. The thing is that what you expect from the state is what? Not to do anything related to your faith. Yeah. Right? keeping out of that business. This is obligation to respect. And 
if you're a religious minority, you're a believer of the spaghetti monster, and the rest of the society attacks you all the time. What you expect from your state at that point is protecting you. You have a right, but state is there to protect your uh, uh, rights from others. So this is obligation to protect. Could you follow that part, what state does to fulfill, to respect and to protect? Okay. The questions at that point, where do those obligations come from? Those obligations spring from international treaties. Bill of Rights, it starts from Bill of Rights, and it continues with all other possible human rights conventions. When the state puts the signature on that treaty, ratifies it, and does the relevant adjustments in their internal domestic legislation, then it creates its own obligations. And then the obligation to fulfill respect and protect starts. And when the state starts to fail fulfilling them, it is not only criticized by its own subjects, I mean citizens, it's also criticized by the fellow uh, treaty members. This is how it is established. Yes, please. Could you explain the obligation to fulfill? Our example was education, or let's say health. You have a right to health. What does that mean? You require then uh, physicists, you require doctors, you require hospitals, and in the hospitals you also necessitate uh, administrative stuff, and you cannot fulfill them. State can do it. State must uh, educate doctors for you, or hire doctors for you, and then state must uh, construct hospital buildings for you. And state is expected to employ the administrative stuff like secretaries and so on for that hospital so that when you have health necessities, state is there to fulfill its uh, part in order to enable you enjoying your right to health. Yes? If you go with the spaghetti monster example, would it be that opening temples for the minorities? Then yes. Yes, establishing temples. If it's the state doing so, then it is obligation to fulfill. Moment. Uh, yes. Can the uh, obligations of the state be changed during the time of the state? Yes. It can. Uh, before uh, the time is allowed for the state uh, officials to be done against the Of course. I mean, the world changes, you know. Therefore, zeitgeist. Uh, and the necessities of the time changes. First of all, in the very beginning, it was job of state to regulate your religion, and later uh, the state has stepped out of that business. So it can change related to the entire international setting, local setting, regional setting. And, uh, states are, uh, states do such obligations when they uh, sign the deal, right? That's true. When they sign treaties, international law compels them so to do so. Before answering that question, you have to read the constitution of that state. The constitution is also obliging states for certain obligations. So perhaps it has not signed an international treaties, but it is already mentioned in its uh, constitution. Therefore, they don't even need to sign international treaties. It is in the constitution. It is the job of the state to fulfill certain uh, obligations. It is not a treaty we have said. Uh, yes, uh -huh. OK. Any other questions? Shall we continue? Well, when we start talking about international human rights protection, of course, our emphasis is for most of the time on the state because it's the main protector, but its obligations are springing from international conventions, treaties, plus its own uh, convention. There are numerous regional and international human rights protection bodies as well. UN itself, the United Nations, it's established for peace and security 
It's established for human rights. It's established for the peaceful settlement of the problems in between states. Then, there are numerous UN bodies that deal with human rights abuses, of course. UNHCR itself is established for protection of uh, asylum seekers and refugees, for instance. What else? You know UNICEF. What does UNICEF do? At least you can say it's for the protection of children's rights. And UN Women is there for the protection of the females in our societies. And Human Rights Council is there that United States have decided to step last year, step out. Yes? Isn't it kind of you discuss about the human rights of the countries? They don't even have the basic human rights in their government. Do you want to be more specific then? What do you mean? I see your point. The thing is that um, I used to teach IR322, International Human Rights Protection Class. Once we start talking about international human rights, there are always some students that raise their hands saying, uh, I don't believe in human rights. It's not a faith. It's not a religion. I'm not asking if you believe in them or not. They exist, they are there. The thing is that you can say that the legal infrastructure is not strong enough for that. Or you can say that social infrastructure in certain countries are not strong enough. Human rights protection is about setting the standards, first of all. And then the standards have to be met. Sometimes they're easily met and sometimes they require some time. I mean, uh, I was a student 20 years ago, whatever. The thing is that as I was a student, well, okay, that has been some time. The thing is that I did not have any female friends in my class that used to have their head scars. They could not enter into universities. That right was deprived. I mean, right to education and people teaching females how to dress. It was not well digested for a long time. Later, it is learned that no one can teach females how to dress up. We decide upon, I put on whatever clothes I want to. And after this was digested, then females' education rights have expanded. So it changes yeah. in time. What I mean is that, for example, there are some countries who you are using that are not in their countries and they are voting for freedom of speech. Yes, of course, controversies are all around and you can explain such things through the political atmosphere in that era. I mean, at the moment, neo-populism or right-wing nationalism is rising a lot and uh, Islamophobia, xenophobia, hatred against migrants, that's rising, H hatred against minorities, that's rising and that's against human rights, but some governments are just helping this happening, unfortunately, right? Or democratic erosion is a huge subject at the moment. Democracy was not the numbers only. Of course, the majority is the majority in the parliament, but it was not uh, like only numbers related to democracy. Small numbers were also included to democracy that everybody should be represented, but in time, by democratic erosion, it has changed that whoever is the winner of the elections is the true owners of that nation and the minorities become the traitors and terrorists and, you know, the story. So this is how it has changed in time. Of course, you can discuss that this is not okay with international human rights standards. True. Uh, international law and international politics, even domestic politics in that sense, go unfortunately hand in hand. All right? Another thing that you want to add or ask? Okay, we were mentioning the uh, international and regional human rights protection institutions. There are numerous. Under United Nations, you can come across with diverse sub bodies of United Nations. That's main aim is protection of human rights. That can be United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. That can be UNICEF. That can be United Nations Human Rights uh, Council and so on. There are multiple examples. Or what is that? OSCE, Organization for 
No one knows. Security and cooperation in Europe. That's aim is also concentrating on human rights. International criminal law, we have studied it all together. And this branch of international law is also established for the protection of human rights from grave um, crimes. We have numerous regional systems. Like we have given the example of European Court of Human Rights. Therefore, when states or are unwilling or unable to fulfill their duties to protect human rights, then regional or international level steps in the game. All right? But the state must be either unable or unwilling. It is the job of the state, it's the duty of the state to protect human rights. We have already started speaking about European Court of Human Rights. What was the answer of the quiz? Do you remember the quiz question? Of course, the individual is expected to fulfill entire domestic remedies. Do you hear that? What's the correct answer once again? What domestic? What did you write in the quiz? It was wrong, that's true. And it was not uh, the fulfilling of entire domestic court steps. In order to go to European Court of Human Rights, first of all, the person has to deprive, has to exhaust entire domestic judicial steps, whatever those steps are. And then it is possible. Otherwise, the European Court of Human Rights does not accept the applications, of course. What else? Actually, the European Court of Human Rights is becoming controversial nowadays in the last months. Once you start reading about them, it sounds like it, it used to be a good memory and now it's not functional. This is how it's depicted in the media. Um, well, European Court of Human Rights is there in order to help individuals against their own states. When your human rights are violated, then you go to the court and you expect some, card, some kind of compensation. And when that compensation, when that reparation never comes, when you're still living and when you're tortured, let's say, you go to the court, that can be compensated. But I don't know if you're ever uh, familiar with the case of Onur Yasircan. Please read about that. That's a huge story. Uh, he used to be a student of Middle East Technical University studying architecture. He was quite beloved by the, not only the family, but he's, he used to be a very um, active student who also works in diverse architectural organizations and makes very really successful drawings and he used to make music. He was so beloved and um, he made a mistake smoking joints. He was spotted by the police and then he was taken to the police station and in the police station his human rights were completely ignored and uh, the way he was tortured was bad. I mean naked search and uh, beating him when he's naked so his dignity was already chewed badly. And he came back home and suddenly that extrovert person stopped talking to his entire friends and family. In a couple of days, he has received another phone call from police station saying that he has to come over once again. He did not dare. He committed a suicide in order not to go back to the police station. And his family has started uh, looking for of course, judicial solutions to what has happened, finding out the police officers who has done this to him. It did not succeed. After 10 years, his mother has jumped out of the very same window that his, uh, her son jumped out. She also has killed herself. And they also have tried their chance by European Court of Human Rights. So actually, this is a sad, sad story. Read it on your own and learn about the case of Onur Yasijan. Most of individuals are dead before they can go before the courts. This is sad. When your human rights are deprived somehow, and if you're still alive, lucky, good. 
But what, ha what happens then when the person dies, then of course the first degree relatives start looking for justice for their dead relatives. Uh, I guess I can finish that part in our next session because I'm out of time. Do you have any questions until here? If not, did you sign the attendance? Yes? Then enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> <laughs>